to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. Today is Friday, February 10th, and I welcome you all to the state's premier civic affairs event. I'm Charity Fain, City Club's Executive Director, and I would like to welcome our members and guests, those of you who join us today at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS Radio, or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Today, we welcome Robert Liberty, who will discuss what Portland might be like in 2062. Will it be a sustainable city in a sustainable world or not? Before we begin our program, oh, sorry, City Club's corporate and media partners are essential to the vitality and sustainability of club activities. I'd like to thank our generous media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, I would also like to extend our deep appreciation to the Friday Forum corporate sponsors, Bank of the Cascades, Miller Nash, Perkins Coie, Stoll Reeves, and The Standards. We are grateful for their support and your commitment to City Club. If your company or firm would like to support City Club's mission through sponsorship, please contact the staff at the back of the room or call the office. In addition to Friday forums, City Club offers events throughout our community. This month, Agoras Committee's Citizens Read book group invites you to join them in discussing two very different books. On February 15th, in conjunction with the Multnomah County Library's Everybody Reads program, the group will discuss The Girl Who Fell from the Sky by Heidi W. Duro. Then the next week, on February 22nd, participants at Citizens Read will examine the disconnect between the skills learned in school and the skills employers need in Tony Wagner's book, The Global Achievement Gap. Find more information about how to attend this event on our website at pdxcityclub.org. Following today's talk, we will be welcoming City Club members to the microphone for a question and answer session with our speaker. In addition, we invite all of our audience members to locate the index cards on your tables, write your questions on them during the forum, and hold them up when I ask later. City Club cl staff will collect these cards, which I will then read from the microphone. We are sure you will come up with some really great questions for today. And now to our program. If one of the great challenges of the 21st century is to achieve both global prosperity and environmental sustainability, our cities and the majority of the world's population that lives in them must rise to meet that challenge. Cities around the nation and the world are emulating Oregon's innovations in sustainability. But how much further do we need to go to become both sustainable and prosperous? Is it even possible to achieve genuine sustainability or, we, or have we, as a species, already gone too far? Today, Robert Liberty will discuss how Oregon can meet that challenge and will speculate about what our region could be like in 2062 if we succeed or if we fail. Robert Liberty has served as a staff attorney and executive director of 1,000 Friends of Oregon, as senior counsel to Congressman Earl Blumenauer, and as an attorney and land use planning consultant in private practice. He was elected to Metro Council in 2004 and was re-elected to a second term in 2008. On the Metro Council, his interests and assignments included affordable housing, transit-oriented development, and serving as a liaison to the Oregon Zoo Foundation. In January 2011, he became the first executive director of the Sustainable Cities Initiative at the University of Oregon which promotes the sustainability of cities in Oregon and around the world through research, education, and public service. And with that, please help me welcome today's speaker, Robert Liberty. Robert. It is the morning of February 10th, 2062. Your alarm sounds and you crawl out of bed. You pull aside the dirty blankets that cover your window, makeshift insulation for your chilly bedroom, to check the weather. Yesterday's forecast called for a pleasant spring day in the mid-60s. The sun streaming in the window is welcome after the torrential rains of the last few days, and it justified your decision yesterday to turn off the power and the gas to save money. 
You need that money to put fuel in your gas tank to get to work. Wrapped in an old down ski jacket, you enter the dark hallway and shuffle past the shut doors of the empty bedrooms. As you go down the hall, you check the dirty rags under the bottom of the door that keep the drafts out. The big old house you occupy is unaffectionately called the Sod House for two reasons. It's an acronym for Street of Dreams. <laughs> this five-bedroom, lavish house was built more than 60 years ago as part of a Street of Dreams project. The second reason it's called the Sod House is that the heart is uh, attributable to the hardened mudslide that covers the backyard and envelops part of the lower floor. Each year, the heavy rains bring down more soil. When you bought the house, it seemed like a bargain. But between mudslides and power bills and distance to work, now it seems more like a white elephant. Hmm, elephants, you ask yourself. I wonder whatever happened to them. You tiptoe into the living room, stepping over the snoring forms of your sister and brother-in-law, wrapped in their sleeping bags in front of the cold ashes of the fire. As you enter the kitchen, you hear the sound of shattering glass nearby, followed by heavy pounding. You reach into the broom closet, pulling out your grandfather's old hunting rifle, and cautiously open the door on the side deck. The smell of last summer's fires, freshened by the sun hitting the charred trunks and limbs in the old park down the hill, assaults your nostrils. There's another crash coming from the boarded-up house across the street, followed by some raucous laughter. It's just the squatters displaced by the fire having a little early morning party. You shut the door and put the gun back in the broom closet. You prepare your breakfast of oatmeal and powdered milk. You poke around to see if there's something left over from last night, but it looks like your sister and worthless brother-in-law have cleared out the fridge. You sigh as you drop the synthetic coffee powder into the hot water. Of all the many things you miss, coffee is in the front rank. Real coffee is a luxury good now, reserved for the tiny population of the super rich. Most of the places that grew coffee in the past are too dry to grow it now. And if they could grow it, they're not, because they're growing food, more valuable crop. In fact, you have no idea what is happening in a number of the former coffee-growing countries. Thinking of coffee makes you think of orange juice. The last time you had orange juice from the orange groves of Sonoma County was eight months ago. Messages, you murmur, and the wall screen lights up. You scan your video messages. There's still no word from your old girlfriend, Deb Johnny, who, despite your pleas, chose to travel to South Asia a week ago for the funeral of her mother. Her last message was four days after her departure, a short but reassuring video to let you know that the riots were confined to the slums on the other side of the city. You see that she has not opened your last two messages. Your mom's sad face looks at you distractedly out of the screen. I don't like it here anymore. I'm lonely, and the food is terrible. Come get me. You hit the delete button. You've heard enough of her whining. <laughs> News, you say. After a short commercial about a new beach resort in the Queen Charlotte Islands, the international news begins with an aerial view of a burning battleship flying the Chinese flag. It was en route to reinforce Air Force troops who were struggling to relieve 10,000 Chinese nationals trapped in a huge industrial park in East Africa. The ship had been struck in the Malacca Strait by missiles fired by Central Asian separatists. There are conflicting reports that radiological and biological weapons are being used in the war in Africa. The next item makes your heart sink. The riots that were across the city when Deb Johnny called have spread across the country. The mil military has been called out, and the Prime Minister fled to the U.S. is now seeking asylum in Canada. Good luck getting into Canada, buddy, you think. The European Union has officially expelled Spain, Italy, and Greece from their membership, the only way they could stop climate refugees from entering the states bordering the North Atlantic and Baltic, the northern tier, as they call themselves. National news is no better. The America First Party has won its second governorship in a state where they already have pluralities in both chambers of legislature. The governor-elect promises to work with its new majority to remove illegals of all types, stripes, colors, and creeds for within the borders of this great state, blah, 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 blah. The National Guard has been called out to clear out squatters from the abandoned ruins of New Orleans. The California Supreme Court has struck down the gas rationing law. Fortunately, the local news provides a nice contrast with a stream of grim international and national news. 
Thanks to the torrential rains of the last few days, reservoirs are filling up nicely, so there'll be little or no water rationing this spring. To the surprise and delight of the region, a lucky local fisherman proved definitively that coho salmon are not extinct in the Clackamas River. It looks like the captive breeding program for the polar bears at the zoo has been successful again. There will be a contest to name the new cub, already the ninth polar bear to be born this year in the world. And even a bit of bad news from the coast has a nice ironic twist. One of the houses that fell off the eroding bluff yesterday was the house of the very same geologist who testified the location was safe for construction. <laughs> Before you can switch off the screen, your boss's face appears in the upper right corner. She looks grim. I have good news and I have bad news for our department today. The good news is that you get another day off. So sit back and relax and enjoy your free time. The bad news is that your vacation is unpaid thanks to another contract cancellation and what management calls a supply chain disruption. Your anxiety spikes. You can't afford another unpaid day off. If this continues, you'll, far, you'll be farther behind in payments for the house and the car. But if you can't work, maybe you don't need the car anyway. Your brother-in-law, unkempt and hungover, appears in the doorway. What's for breakfast, he asks. Not much, you reply. His blurry hangdog expression is deeply irritating. When are you moving back to your own house? When it's safe again, he replies. And when will that be? You tell me, and we'll both know, he says, moving past you toward the oatmeal. Hey, aren't you going to be late for work? Uh, no work today. I can laze around all day, just like you, you reply. You retreat to your room and wrap yourself in your comforter. You call up one of the movies from the turn of the century that you love. Beautiful women, fast cars, luxurious resorts, blue skies, lots of booze. You reach under the bed for the bottle of dried fruit brandy and settle in for the duration, determined not to think any more about tomorrow. That's one vision for a future. It's a little hard to square with what we see around us. For so many in this world, the world is a much better place than it was just a few decades ago. Consider China. In 1976, the year when Chairman Mao died, the Chinese people had experienced almost two centuries of colonization, colonial control, international and civil war, mass starvation, and totalitarian oppression. Then, in virtually a single generation, a generation of peace, they transformed their economy and hundreds of millions of Chinese entered the middle class. Their diets improved dramatically. You can see that in their stature and in their lifespan. And their prospects for the future have changed dramatically for the better. Today, the standard of living in Shanghai, which is the wealthiest part of China, is equivalent to that in Italy. The same thing is happening to hundreds of millions of other people in India, Brazil, Vietnam, and now in a few places in Africa. What took Europe and America 200 years to do, which is industrialization um, and urbanization is happening in 30 years. How can this good news be reconciled, um, this good news about spreading prosperity be reconciled with a bleak picture I painted for our region in 50 years? Well, actually more and more people believe that the one will be the cause of the other. And these people's views are very bleak indeed. James Lovelock is a British scientist who has a background both in biology and technological development. He actually developed sensors for NASA's interplanetary ex, um, exploration probes. In recent years, he has been sounding the alarm about the impact of climate change. In 2008, he predicted a die-off of 80% of the world's population by the end of the century. Equally pessimistic is Martin Rees, a knighted British astronomer and author of Our Final Century. Sir Martin places the odds of survival of our species as an entire species as 50-50 by the end of the century. Jared Diamond is an anthropologist. His book, Collapse, examined both enduring and collapsing civilizations. His review of societies from Mesopotamia to Easter Island to modern Australia has led him to the conclusion that only a few societies have proven sustainable and that many societies have collapsed through a combination of factors that typically include the exhaustion and contamination of the natural systems that support them. Paul Gilding is the former CEO of Greenpeace and a sustainability consultant to major corporations, including DuPont. Mr. Gilding is the author of The Great Disruption. 
Mr. Gilding, who I've met, styles himself as something of an optimist in these circles because he believes our clever and adaptable species will, when we can avoid it no longer, will respond and respond quickly and dramatically. He believes that the integrated global environmental, political, social, and economic crisis that will trigger this change is already underway. And he believes by the end of the century we'll come out with a new and sustainable civilization. But there's going to be a rough patch in the middle. He defines rough patch as the death of two billion people. I had, I won't say the pleasure, but the experience to Ronald Wright deliver a lecture a few years ago in Victoria based on his Massey lecture presentations. That's a very prestigious national lecture uh, award program. His lectures turned into the book entitled Short History of Progress. Wright reviews the rise and fall of prior civilizations in Europe, the Middle East, and the Americas. He believes that our civilization, based on European ideas of technological and material progress, will collapse this century. Not because it's inevitable, but because our ossified institutions and way of thinking will prevent us from responding adequately. The most chilling part of his presentation was his description of how the most extreme expressions of greed, power, hubris in many civilizations come right at their pinnacle immediately before their fall. And he illustrates this with the unfinished paintings in the final temple complexes of the Maya people before that civilization collapsed. And he sees those same signs around us today. Reading these books and listening to these presenters bring to mind Shelley's Osmandias. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand half sunk. A shattered visage lies whose frowned and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor, well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. When I first read this poem, it struck me chiefly as a meditation on, on human pride, imperial pride, but human pride in general. But now the punchline for me is not the inscription on the pedestal, but the final line about the lone and level sand stretching far away. What humbled Ozymandias was not time, after all, but the desert his own civilization created out of land that was overcultivated. A vast desert in southern Iraq now surrounds Uruk, the home of Gilgamesh, the first great city the first great urban civilization. And that desert was created, many anthropologists believe, by soil exhaustion and salinization. Lovelock, Reese, Diamond, Wright, and Gilding all share the belief that the combination of our numbers and our rising affluence means that we're no longer living on our natural income, on the resources that our world's biosphere can produce each year. Instead, we're now spending down our capital, destroying the natural systems that we'll, we will need in coming years to provide us with food, water, shelter, fuel, and the accoutrements of civilization. Perhaps they're just celebrity-seeking catastrophists. Are they providing reading material that appeals to the same people who like to see movies like Titanic, Towering Inferno, or the films about meteorite impacts hitting the Earth? Well, let's take a look at some facts. According to Lei Jiafu, vice head of the State Forestry Administration of China, between 2000 and 2005, 10 million hectares of forest was, quote, occupied, requisitioned, or converted to non-forest uses. How much is 10 million hectares? It's 24.7 million acres. How much is 24.7 million acres? It's pretty much all the forest land in the state of Oregon. What would we think our future would be if five and a half years from now there was no forest land in Oregon? Here is a paragraph from a story that ran in the New York Times eight months ago. Quote, a rising unease about the future of the world's food supply came through during interviews this year with more than 50 agricultural experts working in nine countries. These experts say that in the coming decades, farmers need to withstand whatever climate shocks come their way while roughly doubling the amount of food they produce to meet rising demand. Consider what happened to our own salmon fishery. Before white settlement, the estimated run of all types of salmon, including steelhead, 
uh, in the Columbia Basin was 11 to 15 million fish per year. By the end of the 20th century, it declined to 110,000 to 330,000 fish, about 1.7 percent of the historic run. These are three examples, fragments out of a world of statistics. What's the big picture? In 2000, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan asked scientists to provide a kind of state of the earth report, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. It took five years to complete and engaged 1,360 experts worldwide in the preparation of a scientific assessment of the world's ecosystem services, air, water, agriculture, flood control, pest control, all the natural services we need for civilization. And this is not focused, this is focused on humans' dependence on ecosystems. Here are some of their findings. Humans now use between 40 and 50 percent of the fresh water running off land to which the majority of the population has access. In some regions, such as the Middle East and North Africa, humans use 120 percent of renewable water supplies. At times, the Yellow River in China, a seat of civilization, the Nile in Africa, another seat of civilization, and the Colorado in North America do not even reach the ocean. Approximately one quarter of Earth's terrestrial surface has been transformed to cultivated systems. In many sea areas, the total weight of fish available to be captured is less than one-tenth of that available before the onset of industrial fishing. Since about 1980, approximately 20 percent of the world's coral reefs have been destroyed and a further 20 percent badly degraded or destroyed. The current rate of species extinction is estimate, estimated to be 1,000 times the rate in the fossil record, and it is expected to increase tenfold to 10,000 times the historic rate during this century. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Board offered this summary of the results, quote, nearly two-thirds of the services provided by nature to humankind are found to be in decline worldwide. In effect, the benefits reaped from our engineering of the planet have been achieved by running down natural capital assets. In many cases, it is literally a matter of living on borrowed time. By using up supplies of fresh groundwater faster than they can be recharged, for example, we are depleting assets at the expense of our children. Unless we acknowledge the debt and prevent it from growing, we place in jeopardy the dreams of citizens everywhere to rid the world of hunger, extreme poverty, and avoidable disease, as well as increasing the risk of sudden changes to the planet's life support systems from which even the wealthiest may not be shielded. Many people hope that we can reduce our overdraft on natural systems by becoming more efficient in our use of these materials. In fact, we have become more efficient, vastly more efficient. But the idea that efficiencies by themselves can allow our natural income to meet the growing uh, demands of a rising population and growing affluence come up against some basic mathematics that make that as a solution highly improbable. Consider this excerpt from a column last month by Robert Samuelson on the subject of U.S. energy policy. Quote, in 2010, it took about half the energy to produce a dollar's worth of output, gross domestic product, as in 1980. That is, twice as efficient. But, he adds, it would take Herculean efforts to cut greenhouse gas emissions sharply. The gains in efficiency and the expansion of renewables will be offset by increased energy demand from a larger population and more homes, office buildings, shopping malls, and cars. In 2035, emissions of carbon dioxide, the largest greenhouse gas, are reckoned to be 3 percent higher than in 2010. This contrasts with the decline of 50 percent to 80 percent by mid-century that some scientists say are needed to stabilize global temperatures. It is hard to see how, under plausible assumptions, greenhouse gas emissions could be reduced substantially in the foreseeable future. The pressures of population and economic growth overwhelm improved energy efficiencies or shifts to green energy. Is there no hope? Should we give up being responsible and enter into an extended bacchanal during the twilight of our civilization? <laughs> no, of, of course not. Besides, some of us are getting along in the tooth for an extended bacchanal. <laughs> Sounds about as exhausting as a Portland planning process. <clears throat> we need to remember that change can happen far more suddenly than we ever anticipated once our minds are changed. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was published in 1962, and she died of cancer in 1964. Could she have predicted that in the dozen years, starting with the year of her death, that the most important federal environmental laws would be passed? The Wilderness Act in 1964, the National Environmental Policy Act in 1969, the Clean Air Act in 1970, 
the Clean Water Act and the Federal Coastal Zone Management Acts in 1972, the Endangered Species Act in 1973, and the Resource Conservation and Recovery and Toxic Substances Control Acts in 1976. In 1962, this city center and its inner neighborhoods were dying and the Willamette River was still highly polluted. Who could have predicted then that in 2012 the riverfront would be a, a, a site for luxury homes and that swaths of the city set aside for new highways would be desirable locations for young middle class professionals? Did anyone, could anyone have predicted 1962 or 1972 or even 1992 that by 2012 Portland would be pilloried and parodied for being too hip, too cool, and that food critics would be tr treading the sidewalks of North Portland. In 1992, who believed that the United States would elect a black president in 2008? The possibility of rapid change is the basis for hope. This place, of all places, has reasons for hope because it has demonstrated the possibility of change and planted the seeds for a new kind of life, a new and sustainable city and civilization. This is evident now from space in the way in which we have reshaped the growth of our communities. If you use Google Earth, you can examine the pattern of growth in and around Portland, or for that matter, McMinnville, and compare it to some comparable sized city in Indiana or Texas or Florida. McMinnville and the Portland metro area, like most, but not all cities in Oregon, has a clear edge between the city and the countryside, between the land we need for houses, industry, employment, and the land that grows our food and fiber and that provides places for wildlife and water. And that urban edge is expanding outward much more slowly than people 20 and 30 years ago expected. In the 11 years ending December 31st, 2008, there were about 100,000 homes built in the three counties in this region. 95% of all those homes were built in the boundary established in 1979. We added 18,000 acres to the boundary to accommodate growth. It's accommodated less than in, in 19, uh, 1998 to about 2003. It's accommodated less than 1% of the homes because they're not the right location. As this century progresses, we and the rest of the world will need the land protected outside urban growth boundaries for food, for fiber, for water. But our rural landscape is more than just a crop production area. We need it to store carbon and to store and clean our water, and we need it as a reservoir of biological diversity, which is part of the resilience of natural systems. States and regions around the country have adopted many goals for the reducing greenhouse gases, but as far as I know, this region is the only mid-sized metropolitan area that is actually making progress, that actually has lower emissions despite our growth uh, than it did 20 years ago. And now Metro, our esteemed regional government, acting under a state mandate, it's going beyond other regions' efforts to think about making changes, to developing a scenario to reduce greenhouse gases, and then working with all the partner cities to actually implement that alternative. It will be easier here because our prior planning efforts have avoided sprawl. We've invested more heavily in transit and active transportation, and infill and redevelopment in our neighborhoods both supports and is supported by transit investments. Now, the broad brush that separates city from country is complemented here by the integration of natural systems into our urban designs and infrastructure. What once was the antithesis of city and nature is now becoming a synthesis in the form of green roofs, green stormwater infrastructure, green walls, and many other expressions of this new idea. These achievements are attributable not just to enlightened leaders, but to large number and broad range of nonprofit groups concerned with all aspects of sustainability. Thousand Friends of Oregon, the Oregon Green Spaces Institute, the Oregon Environmental Council, Coalition for a Liberal Future, Portland, Oregon Sustainability Institute, the Center for Earth Leadership, Audubon Society of Portland, the many watershed councils, riverkeeper organizations, conservancies, and civic organizations like League of Women Voters City Club. And I forgive uh, people for not listing them all, but I would have required another hour. These groups running the spectrum from bright green to light green are a critical and unique part of our dynamic civic infrastructure by turns creative, contentious, and consensus building. They play very essential roles. The most recent round of cleaning up the Willamette and Tualatin rivers from combined sewage overflows did not happen by the grace and favor of an enlightened leadership. I'm sorry to say, 
or not alone by that reason, <clears throat> our governments were sued into compliance by citizen groups. As someone from this region has said, activists are hell to live with, but they make great ancestors. <laughs> These organizations feed into and draw upon our incredibly active and knowledgeable citizenry. But our sustainability advantage here is not limited to government, nonprofit organizations, and active citizens. Many businesses in this region have embraced sustainability, and indeed sustainability is the business of a growing number of them. Portland design firms have played a prominent role in designing and building green buildings, buildings that dramatically reduce the draft on our water and energy needs. We have designers of sustainable sportswear, reusable diapers, rain harvesting companies, and stores that deliver mattresses by bicycle. The big firms hire sustainability coordinators, buy organic food for their cafeterias, and use the renewable power generated by our thoughtful and far-seeing utilities. A recent example of how these different sectors can come together concerns houses. Americans' houses are symbols of our sustainability problem. In 1950, the average home in the United States was 983 square feet. By 2006, near the peak of the real estate bubble, the average square footage had increased to 2,349 square feet. The houses got much bigger, but the number of people on them decreased dramatically. In 1950, 60% of the households in the United States consisted of three or more people. In 2006, 60% of the households consisted of just one or two persons. 27% of our households are one person. So the amount of house per person is more than tripled in the U.S. in the last 60 years, and those houses are so stuffed with stuff that we have acres and acres of storage units across the landscape. <laughs> Last year, a hardworking group of people interested in small, efficient, and affordable houses was convened by Jordan Palmieri at Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. Participating in that group are developers like Eli Spivak of Orange Spot Development and Builders, working alongside government regulators, members of nonprofit groups, a representative from a university, and people who do not own a business, work for government or a nonprofit. This highly collaborative group is exploring the opportunities for the design and development of small, efficient homes for people who have less to spend, want to spend less, want to have less debt, and want to put less stuff in a house. In addition to businesses, nonprofit organizations, active citizens, and governments, important roles are played by our local universities in creating sustainable cities and sustainable civilizations. A wonderful illustration of leading by example is Reed College and its efforts to restore Crystal Springs, a part of the Johnson Creek watershed, and to bring salmon to the campus. Of course, only very smart salmon will be allowed entry. <laughs> Oregon State University is carrying out nationally valuable work on climate modeling. Its horticulture staff is providing expertise in the development of green stormwater infrastructure. It is home to the Institute for Natural Resources, led for a time by the late Gail Ackerman. Its researchers provide valuable documentation of the successes and weaknesses of Oregon's efforts to protect farm and forest lands. Portland State University has been a leader in land use planning research and education for decades. Just a few weeks ago, PSU was reconfirmed as one of the nation's leading transportation research centers in partnership with the University of Oregon, Oregon Institute of Technology, a new partner, the University of Utah, which, by the way, has a lot of ex-Oregonians on its faculty. It was PSU professor Jennifer Dill who had the vision that proved compelling to the James Miller family when they gave $25 million for the Institute for Sustainable Solutions. And last, certainly not least, is my own university, the University of Oregon. Its architecture school is one of the top-ranked green design programs in the nation. The law school's environment and natural resources program is one of the best in the country, although it has a friendly competitor here uh, at Lewis and Clark Law School. It's home to the Institute for a Sustainable Environment, where Drs. David Hulse and Bart Johnson work. The Institute has been exploring in a really profound and deep way the dynamics of ecological change and the consequences of different policies for the Willamette Valley, which is home to two out of every three Oregonians. Members of the University of Oregon chemistry faculty have provided leadership in creating the green chemistry movement, which is reshaping both chemistry education and research. Leadership is reflected by recent major grant awards. The Green Chemistry Program is now linked to the Green Product Design Program. 
Brendan Bohannon is a professor of biology at the University of Oregon, and his focus is on microbial life. Now, we like to think we're the pinnacle of creation, but if you look at the tree of life on our planet, virtually all the canopy is occupied by microbes. Microbes may be small, but they are critical to the entire life support system on which we depend. Brendan leads a research group focused on fundamental drivers of microbial biodiversity, the response of uh, micro, uh, microbial biodiversity to environmental change, and diversity of microbes in human-dominated environments. My own experience is with the Sustainable Cities Initiative, an effort conceived by professors Mark Schlossberger, Schlossberg, I'm sorry, Nico Larco, and Robert Young. Today, about 25 faculty members participate in one aspect or another of the Sustainable Cities Initiative. Our best known effort is the Sustainable City Year program. That program creates a partner each year between the University of Oregon and one Oregon city. The city and, uh, and uh, staff and faculty get together and define a set of challenges that uh, city projects uh, that they're asking the university students to address, projects that will advance city sustainability. The scale and breadth of the work are one of the distinctive aspects. In Salem last year, we had 25 faculty members, I'm sorry, 20 faculty members in 25 courses working with 500 plus students in 11 different disciplines addressing these 15 projects. We have estimated the students spent between 50,000 and 80,000 hours working on city projects. They included everything from rethinking street lighting to be more uh, energy efficient, to finding an energy application for waste products, uh, urban renewal, transportation planning for active transportation, that's biking and walking, and civic engagement by poor minorities. The disciplines involved included law, architecture, urban planning, journalism and communication, green product design, business, landscape, architecture, geography, and civil engineering at Portland State University. And it's not just a student project. Salem's implementing a set of those uh, recommendations and proposals. Our partner this year is Springfield. Students are helping design a new uh, sustainable library, figuring out how to redevelop a mill site, site, and developing new plans for bike paths, among other things. New York Times has called the program, quote, perhaps the most comprehensive effort by a U.S. university to infuse sustainability into its curriculum and community outreach. We have several other projects underway. We have joined with the cities of Springfield and Eugene, Lane County, Eugene Water and Electric Board, St. Vincent de Paul, and I, I stop here. I, you really need to invite Terry McDonald from St. Vincent de Paul to talk to you here. He's a really remarkable person. Um, and many others in the Lane Livability Consortium. That consortium was created through our participation in a grant from the Sustainable Communities Regional Planning Program of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Transportation, and Environmental Protection. Within that context, we're working on two projects. One is linking the growing Latino population with sustainability indicators and teaming up uh, with the Sightline Institute in Seattle to do that. Another one, which reflects, I think, a permanent uh, stringency in funding for infrastructure, is to figure out how to determine which investments in transportation best address the triple bottom line, social justice, environmental protection and restoration, economic development. I know that whatever we learn needs to be applied to many of the transportation projects in this region. <clears throat> During a time of financial as well as ecological constraint, we must learn how to do more with less. We are developing a spectrum of international activities that are a mix of research, education, and service. A major focus of those efforts is China. China expects 300 million people to move into its cities in the next 20 years. I have stood on a man-created hill looking at a man-made lake that is five miles in length and 25,000 housing units under construction simultaneously a project that barely registers on anyone's consciousness in China. U of O planning professor Yi Zhao Yang has spearheaded our efforts with partners in China. In July, University of Oregon faculty and faculty from the Tsinghua University Planning and Design Institute will have their first joint symposium on green urban design and planning. Our partner in this effort, Professor Hu Jie, not only wants to exchange new ideas, but put them into practice in China, as he said, you have the ideas, and we can implement them immediately. Professor Hu is a leading exponent of combining the traditional concept of shan shui, which means mountain water design, with ecological principles. 
He led the team that designed the enormous Forest Park north of the Olympic venues, which is twice the size of Central Park. This park has its own water system, capturing and cleaning rain rainwater that falls on site and takes discharge from the sewage treatment plants in the city, as well as recycling the human waste on site. It's pretty amazing. And is bringing wildlife back to the center of Beijing, bird species that haven't been seen for decades. In October, we expect to return the favor uh, by hosting faculty and staff from Tsinghua University Planning and Design Institute here in Oregon. Other connections with China include U of O student internships with Planning and Design Institutes, and in April we welcome our first visiting scholar from the Chengdu Institute of Planning and Design. Late this summer, Professors Robert Young and Dennis Ruggeri are organizing a trip by students from the University of Oregon to combine service and education in the community of Bahia de Caracas. It's a coastal city in Ecuador, which, after devastating uh, natural disasters, chose not to take money from the World Bank, but to embark on a path of a sustainable development. Professor Ruggeri has also been providing de design advice to a new city in Algeria and developing a study abroad program for students who wish to learn more about advanced sustainability techniques in Northern Europe. The government of Gabon in West Africa is discussing a large-scale collaboration with the University of Oregon across a spectrum of sustainability activities which may include work on sustainability planning for the capital of Libreville. In April, we'll be meeting with two members of the faculty of the University of Auckland in New Zealand to discuss collaboration for cooperative, uh, cooperative and comparative research around the implementation of metropolitan land use plans in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the Pacific Northwest. I will end this accounting of some of the sustainable cities work going on in the University of Oregon appropriately with an anecdote about an accounting professor in the business school, David Gunther. Professor Gunther's papers have been published in leading academic journals in accounting and finance, including the Journal of Financial Economics, the Journal of Accounting and Economics, the Accounting Review, and the Journal of Accounting Research, and his papers have been awarded the American Taxation Association's Annual Tax Manuscript Award three times. You'll notice what I'm not mentioning. This year, he chose to take his sabbatical at the University of Oxford studying at the Environmental Change Institute there. He's studying why and how business will be reporting their impacts on the environment. When I met with him, I asked him about his prior work on sustainability issues and found out there had been none. Why are you doing this? I asked. He replied, I think it's the coming thing, and I want to learn about it. I believe this is a sign that many minds are beginning to change. In a fundamental way, I believe we must shift our thinking about the purpose of life and the life of our cities. Cities have a dual character. They have been and continue to be places both where things and experience are created and consumed. Cities, which are the essence of civilization, have been celebrated and decried as centers of commerce and consumption. But they're also celebrated as places of multiple and intense human interaction. Research done at other universities have quantified and confirmed a common sense idea that money or things cannot buy happiness. After a certain modest level of material comfort is attained, the additional increments of money, of things, of consumption provide only a very temporary high before we revert to a prior level of discontent. Some of the richest countries in material terms are not among the happiest. But in the cities where most humans live, they also provide opportunity for those other things which the same research shows does provide happiness and which even lengthens lives, social interactions. Instead of a big house full of rich things isolated on its big lot at the edge of the city, what if we were to substitute a small house with not so many things but enfolding and surrounded by the rich and sustaining social experience of the city. Can we find fulfillment and sustainability by consuming experience instead of things? It's the morning of February 10th, 2012. <clears throat> Your small, well-insulated bedroom is cool but comfortable. No need to turn on the batteries today. Your house effectually is known affectionately as a sod house because it was once a street of dreams home, but also because you have used sod to insulate the lower floor, it's already bustling with activity. Your sister and her husband have been busy in the kitchen making a breakfast for all eight of you. Oatmeal, fresh milk, a compote of dried fruit from the garden. No coffee, of course. You hardly remember the taste of it, but hot spice cider is a pretty good substitute. What's for dinner, you ask your brother-in-law, a wizard-like in kitchen and garden? Let's see. 
There's going to be a winter salad with a vinaigrette made from Rogue Valley olive oil and balsamic vinegar, a squash soup, and a little of the smoked salmon from yesterday. Sounds delicious, you say, through a mouthful of oatmeal. You skip watching the news since your niece and nephew are in the middle of a video report about efforts to reintroduce elephants to the wild in Africa. Your mother comes into the room. Are you headed to work today, dear, she says. No, this week I only work on Monday and Wednesday. I'm going to put in my hours at the food co-op, then cycle over to Beaverton to meet a visiting music scholar from Indonesia. Really, from Indonesia? Yes, he came in on last week's Trans-Pacific flight to San Francisco. Can I go with you partway to downtown, she asks. Mom, I know you hate being reminded of it, but you're 74. Are you sure you want to be out on a bike? Oh, for goodness sake. You didn't object when I biked to the store to pick up your order. Fine. I'll take Bill's electric trike. Is that okay with you, my overly protective son? Yes, Mom, that's okay with me. Glad to have you along. You open the door to the warm February sunshine, and the two of you ride off into the better future that you, me, and all of us are going to create. Thank you. Thank you so much for your enlightening presentation. And now, if you've written a question on an index card, now is the time to hold it up so that the staff can collect it from you. Thanks. Uh, the first question of our speaker will be from our Friday Forum host, Promise King. Promise is the executive director of Oregon League of Minority Voters and also wrote on race and politics as a columnist for the Portland Tribune. Promise is a member of the City Club Board of Governors and been a member since 2008. Promise? Uh, Robert, I just want to thank you for your services to this state and this region. I was supposed to ask a very hardball question, but having known you for so long, I, I'm going to give you a pass today. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, for the past three decades, uh, this region planning culture has been always about uh, lifestyle issues, parks, rec, bridges, and all that. How do we mesh using the lens of bread and butter issues? How do we blend both? Because some are asking that it is becoming a building contest. It's not my opinion, but that's what the critics are saying. So how do we blend both the economics and the uh, lifestyle issue uh, in preserving our region? <clears throat> I would start with a big picture comment that the questions of equity and fairness and economic prosperity and global sustainability are completely blended. They're inextricable. Why is that? Because the rich nations provided most of the carbon loading in the atmosphere that now creates a risk. And the developing nations are now contributing to it. Well, who's responsible? So this is one of the reasons that the negotiations are not successful, because it doesn't feel fair to anyone for the rich people who created the first part of the problem now prevent other people from enjoying what they have enjoyed. So I think these things are going to be deeply connected and there are so many organizations internationally that combine sustainability with economic development and opportunity. Some of them here, I think Mercy Corps is a good example locally about thinking about how to provide opportunity and economic um, improvement for the lives of many people at the same time restoring the environment which is the basis for our economy. Locally, as you know, Promise, there is a nice overlap between addressing issues of equity when we talk about things like restoring neighborhoods or investing first in places that require it. And I think if we think more broadly, again, think uh, about uh, new ways of defining economic development to say maybe helping people at the bottom of the ring rung to move up is far more important than helping people at the top to get richer and richer. And I think uh, we have made a lot of progress here in trying to combine issues of economic opportunity, social justice, and sustainability. We have a long way to go, but um, I see some promise there. Thank you. We will now take questions from the floor. As always, members are invited to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions at the Friday Four microphone is a privilege of City Club membership. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. 
If I flash a question mark, it means please wrap up your question. Also, I will read at least one audience member index card question. Robert, Mike Houck, City Club member. Um, I, I'm really gratified that you pointed out the importance of green infrastructure, of parks, trails, natural areas, although you did not mention them specifically inside the urban growth boundary because we've fought a long battle to, to come to realize that we need to not just protect nature out there but inside the UGP. So thank you for your leadership in that, in that arena. We have a local group, the, the Intertwine Alliance, that's uh, working with Houston, Cleveland, LA, Chicago, and other metropolitan regions to try to figure out how to bring more federal resources to our regions to help us do this work. Given your many junkets um, throughout Europe and internationally, are there regions that you would recommend we interact with at the, at the international level um, to share information with one another? Well, I, I'm not as well-traveled as you might think. Um, and it eases my guilt a little bit. My last trip to New Zealand generated 6.2 metric tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, my impression, Mike, is that uh, Northern Europe has the most to teach us. There's some similarity in climate. They're a very affluent area, more affluent than we are, actually. And um, their efforts to integrate um, nature and natural systems into their design, I think, is where we can find some instruction. I would say this, though. It's very interesting that uh, I spoke at a conference, a design and planning conference in Beijing in August. And um, before I spoke, I was a little nervous about how some of my comments would be received, although I never lecture any host community. I simply say, this is what we do and this is what we have learned. But there was a vice minister for construction, who was very high up in the Chinese government, and he diver uh, delivered a scathing critique of their pattern of development in China. And he said, we have to learn how to and we must first end the era of massive construction and massive destruction. And we have to model our, our cities and the change in them in a more organic, tailored way that mirrors natural systems. And he showed images from Portland. So even a place like China, which is very diverse in their opinions, um, I see some uh, signs of new thinking. So we have a lot to learn from other places. And in turn, it's our responsibility to help teach and share what we've learned to other places. Uh, Ray Polani, uh, City Club member. The headline on the bulletin says Metro Portland in 2062. That's 50 years from now. My question is, will Portland have a transit subway in 2062? It would not be a City Club lunch without a question on <laughs> transit from Ray Polani. And, and, <clears throat> and Actually, uh, Mike uh, and Ray and so many of you in the audience are really the reason this place is different. And uh, persistent is actually a very important part of uh, realizing some of these ideas. And Ray is certainly per persistent. I, my concern is that we spend money where it's most effectively used. And the transit tunnel would speed um, time across the region. But Ray, I think there's something to be said about um, instead of concentrating as much development as possible in, in the core, having more places that are vibrant, neighborhoods that are self-contained where you don't have to travel far. And that is consistent with a system where we have a lot, we have abundant transit, uh, high frequency, and not high speeds. So it seems to me that one of the arguments for the transit uh, tunnel segment is to increase speed. So I'm not uh, taking a firm stand, but it's the kind of thing I sh think we should think about because everything going forward is a matter of trade-off. And I think, uh, like you, I believe we need a lot more transit, but we need to think carefully about what we invest in, who we serve, and whether there might be other things we can do with that money that actually uh, decreases even more our dependence on the automobile. I'm going to ask a question from the cards now. What collaboration is being taken between Portland region and other areas in the U.S.? As they say, as, as Ohio goes, so goes the nation. <laughs> is that a threat? <laughs> Just reading from the card. Um, actually, there's a, a, a lot of interchange between different parts of the country in this region. In fact, at uh, Portland State University, Nancy Hales has uh, led the development of a program to take the burden off all the different businesses and nonprofit groups and governments that are asked to host endless streams of tourists, or, I mean, uh, 
policy tourists, I guess you'd call them. In fact, last night I had a dinner with two women from Indianapolis. There'll be a delegation here. Um, the good news, increasingly, is that we have something to learn from them. In the case of Indianapolis, they have apparently a fantastic urban garden program. I've been very successful with that, and they have a very high level of civic engagement. I'm not a big Super Bowl fan, but I was impressed to hear they had 18,000 volunteers, unpaid, no promise of a ticket to the game, to help with visitors. So um, I would say we lead in some ways, and we follow in others, and that's a good thing. Uh, we don't want to be so unique that everyone wants to move here. Chris Andre, City Club member. Thank you so much for that, Robert Levy. That was indeed um, a vision of the future that I think that uh, any one of us in this room would want to, to be part of. What I think is very instructive, though, is that uh, changing culture is, is going to be the nut of it. And I think that that's what every, every word you spoke today was about changing the culture of consumption. It's instructive to look around at the room. Uh, the people who are here and the people who are not here. I believe that, a change, that we have corporate America defended by uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council's uh, sort of junkyard dro dog um, role. But changing, changing a culture is very, very difficult. We have a culture of consumption, and yet we have a finite system, and at the same time, growth is essential. How do we find our way to growth uh, at a lowered rate of consumption it's with a fundamental cultural change driving that? I like the softball questions better. Um, put it this way, we're going to get to sustainability. That's a given. The question is how and how many people will be here to experience that change. I agree with Paul Gilding that what we're doing now is preparing millions of people around the world to provide constructive leadership when other people's minds finally change. It's very, some of us are actually leading by example, I wouldn't include myself particularly in that group, by living in a much lower impact way. But many of us in this region actually have begun to take steps that lower impact. But I don't think, fundamentally, I don't think the culture is going to change until we're ready, and I don't think we'll be ready until there's a crisis. So our job now is to get ready for the crisis, and to make sure that that crisis leads to a better world and not to a darker future. Chris Smith, City Club member, uh, my question is a little bit of a follow-up on that. Um, however efficient we are as a, as a society at using resources, the fact that we seem to stubbornly increase the number of human beings on the planet is a big problem. Um, but perversely, the only societies that seem capable of limiting their, their population growth are those that enjoy prosperity and education. And the only economic system that seems to deliver pr prosperity and education consistently is some form of regulated capitalism that requires growth as an assumption. So at the macro scale of human population, is there any way other than a crisis to get that part of the equation under control? I think the answer is no. But um, <clears throat> it's interesting, the relationship, there is actually a, a direct relationship, not a good one, between smaller families and consumption. I saw this actually in a trip uh, in Italy many years ago where the countryside looked very beautiful, then I realized there was a lot of new development in the countryside. The Italians' population is falling, and they're spending their money that they're not spending on children on more houses and more things. So this is difficult. Um, I think we're going, to, we're going to find a balance with population affluence and um, sustainability one way or another. And, uh, I, what I would say is that I think in the past we focused too heavily on population control, and I think we will reach a maximum. I don't know what that world will be like if we hit 9 billion, but population does fall. So then the question is affluence. Um, I guess I agree with uh, Paul Gilding. I don't know about the grimmer aspects, but I think it's going to be a very bumpy ride. Uh, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, the Columbia River crossing. <laughs> Uh, will probably lead to increased suburbanization, CO2, etc. Um, what's your feeling about uh, that uh, most massive 
public infrastructure expenditure ever ex uh, existing here. Um, what's your take on whether we should go ahead with it? Gosh, I've never thought about that. <laughs> <clears throat> um, the Columbia River Crossing proposal will never be built because the money isn't there. In fact, I don't know if it was in the Atlantic Monthly or the New Yorker, but they had a kind of startling story about the briefing papers given to President Obama and his notes on it. I mean, someone's got to be fired in the White House. And there was a proposal from Jim Oberstar, uh, who is the leader on the Democratic side in the House on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, asking for what the Dem Democrats have always asked for, which is a tax increase to build more stuff. And President Obama wrote no next to it and underlined it twice. I just don't think we're going to have the money. I don't think we're going to raise taxes in Medford to pay for a project to help commuters from Vancouver. And the sad thing is, uh, not that this uh, happens anywhere in the United States, because it's the result of typical way of thinking about the problem, defining the problem. What's disappointing is that it happened here. Now, that said, the good news is that a lot of people, including people in this room, have been developing many alternatives. And I believe there are many alternatives to make things better. I don't think anyone likes being stuck in traffic. The question is how much do you pay for what kind of relief, for what purpose? So I think ultimately we will, we will not be building that. We'll build something else. In fact, the governor's statement about removing the interchanges, which when you think about the project, is actually one of the big justifications for it, is an indication of what's going to happen, is that I think the project will gradually fall apart politically. What we will have done is wasted 10 years on something that didn't make sense, that we need something smarter, cheaper, greener, fairer. I believe there are many ways of doing that. And this will be one of the tests coming up in this decade about whether we demonstrate leadership or not. We have run out of time for further questions and we'll have to stop for the day. Please join us next week for the State of the County with Jeff Kogan. And as we close for today, please join me in offering a sincere thanks to today's speaker, Robert Liberty. We are adjourned. <laughs>